All right, welcome back. This is part two of controllers, where we'll explain how our Barkyard controllers work. This is going to be quite detailed and more of a, a example session, if you will, for software programmers, people that are interested in modifying a, an Arduino sketch. And I hope this doesn't sound scripted because it is to a certain extent, just so I don't stray down <laughs> another rabbit hole. Okay, so a generic Arduino sketch is uh, an INO file. It's basically a C file and it has a standard structure uh, set up in a loop, if you will. So you include at the top of the file, well, here, let's do this. Let's. Uh, Let's add a new Arduino project and we'll call it controller. Oops. <laughs> okay. L L E R. There we go. Close enough. And the magic of the internet. Well, <laughs> The magic of the the v, the v micro extension to Visual Studio. You see, it created a new INO file with a setup and a loop function. So basically, you include all your stuff with a .h file and include file up here. Any functions that you need for setup and loop, and then plug those into the setup and loop. Now the way this works is uh, the setup is called once after boot and once everything is set up then the loop function is called continuously during operation. So it's fairly straightforward. It, it's limited and that's the trade-off that you make for straightforward. So All right, well, in uh, trying to put together the rough cut of this video, I realized that I had way too much detail to put in one or even two or three videos. So I'm going to cut to the chase and just give a high level overview of our controllers. Um, I've already described how an Arduino sketch has a setup and a loop and rather than going through all the typing and here's how I did it I skipped straight to one that I'm currently working on which is a, a sound module in looking at this you can see that I've already put together a few pieces here for the setup and for the if I can get to it the loop function and I've added a few other things like ping and whatnot just for debugging purposes. And again, not to go down a rabbit hole of too much detail, this is just an example of how I use the basic Arduino setup. So the first thing I'd normally start off with would be a, like a pin setup or some other kind of setup. In this case, it's... Uh, start Wi-Fi and then start the actual uh, MP3 player and all those pin assignments get taken care of within these uh, or hidden if you will within these start functions for the specific um, pieces of hardware. So generally a pin setup would allocate the pins or the pin assignments if you will uh, pre-compile time. It's the first customization of the setup with defaults. If you think about it, you need to immediately quiesce outputs at, at startup. You don't want an engine uh, when you turn on the, the controller to start racing off in the reverse direction and then all of a sudden stop because it got reset finally. You want to do that all up front. And then uh, we couple that with reading the configuration file. So that would be this start spiffs here, which um, 
starts the file system and then any setup functions that need to register uh, a parser, if you will, uh, a means of reading that configuration that knows what it's looking for in the config file. And that's what this parser piece is here. The SPIFS is short for uh, SPY flash file system. And what's SPY? <laughs> that's Serial Peripheral Interconnect. So on our flash, we have, and the flash is built into the ESP8266. It's uh, four megabytes. So once we read the configuration, now we can do the second round of pin setup, which in this case would be, you know, part of start DF player, um, well, starting the MP3 player, starting up the Wi-Fi. So we've already, we're assuming this setup Wi-Fi registered a means of reading the SSID and the password, the credentials for the, the stations we want to try and connect to and the access point uh, that we want to advertise for this controller. Uh, it basically gives us a second customization with the new configuration information. Uh, the, the pin settings are finalized at this point, and if there's any sort of other initialization, like for instance in a block controller, while we're talking about setup pin mode, might as well go look at that function. So here we have what I was talking about, the true-false initializing. So it comes through, does the initialization step to quiesce everything, and then gets out of dodge. <laughs> So as part of the pin setup, the next thing we do after the initial quieting of the pins is to set up the I2C, the I2C bus. Some people call it the IIC bus. It stands for Inter-Integrated Circuit Connections, if you will. This will initialize any devices on that bus <coughs> um, by scanning for known or registered devices. In our case, we, we could have a digital to analog converter, analog digital converter, a display like an OLED display, any, any other, any devices on the bus. We initialize the I2C and then register the devices we expect. So then we start the, the scan and what happens is while it's scanning, it will call back these registered functions to say, hey, I found you with the address that you told me. At that point, we can complete setting up anything that we need to do the second round of the pin setup. So if there's any other um, initialization that needs done in setup, this is where we would do it. So the next step would be the whole Wi-Fi and web startup. If we want to talk to this controller via Wi-Fi, then we have to tell it to start. There are, um, there are many pieces to the, the puzzle. Wi-Fi and uh, the access point or AP proper, the, the web server. WebSocket server, an MDNS server, an OTA server, you name it, we start it. <laughs> so for Wi-Fi proper, we, uh, we don't want to depend on having to connect to a Wi-Fi network. So what we would do would be to start in access point mode, which just means we, we look like a hotspot. Anything that can connect via Wi-Fi can connect to the controller. You're not dependent on having to have a whole network. You can walk up to it with your phone, say connect to, uh, let's see, where's a, let's take a look at, not only do we specify the SSID and password, the credentials for the access point or hotspot we want to create, but we also give a list of access points we 
would like to potentially connect to. In this case, it's just the one. And again, you can see it gives the credentials needed to or necessary to connect to that particular access point. Really, it should be stations because we're going to connect in station mode. But uh, that's the whole means or the whole meaning of the Wi-Fi multi include file is it's uh, capable of multiple connections. It can be both an access point and stay connected in station mode and communicate between the, the two. The next step is the web server, which will handle any requests, any hypertext transport protocol connections. The next thing uh, is the web socket server. Well, not necessarily the next thing, but related to it closely is web socket server. And um, this is how all the command and response traffic is relayed between any client of the controller and the controller itself. Uh, next would be the MDNS server, and this is uh, primarily an Apple uh, invention, if you will, that uses the bonjour. So I'm sure I butchered that again, not French. It's a service that runs for Windows, but it allows this MDS, MDNS name to become part of the naming service, if you will. Just type in Wi-Fi block module dot local and this bonjour service should be able to map that to 192.168.1. Whatever the the IP address is that the controller was given when it connected to one of these access points in station mode. The final setup for web and, and Wi-Fi is the OTA server, which is over the air. It allows uh, modifications, as it says, over the air, or as the name implies, over the air. <clears throat> it requires a, a username and a password, uh, credentials, if you will. And I'd go into more, it's beyond the scope of this. I'm just trying to describe how our controllers work and interact with uh, web clients. The next thing to discuss would be the generic command and response structure. So let's see, under block controller, can I get to the map of commands. Here we go. So if you see here, there's a map of command name and command handler. So for power, it's set power. For speed, it's set speed. So on and so forth. So again, these are functions that will eventually live in their own file. But for now, they kind of pollute the space. And I'm in the middle of cleaning up the block controller sketch. The point is that there's a corresponding map of handlers for responses and sending those commands on the client side. So let's open the, where's the web socket? And where is the, is it up? Yes, here we go. So if you will, here's the corresponding, oh, for Pete's sake, not what I wanted to do. <laughs> Missed by character. So here's the, the different uh, mappings. The next is a list of potential commands or responses, should I say, from other sources than this control point. Uh, for instance, uh, the encoder knob on the front of the controller itself, if it's a block controller, 
or another remotely connected client uh, through the web interface moves the slider, we'd like to know that the speed changed, the direction changed, whether the unit's been powered off. The next list is a set of responses that are necessary to update controls on the the web interface in this case uh, a constant stream of the current readings and if it happens to be a uh, digital to analog converter controlled system then we want to know if we change the speed what the calculated uh, digital to analog converter value is set to and the last list is just a uh, a response that we'd like to see echoed in the console in the JavaScript console that allows for debugging and uh, for instance frequency we're not using it unless it's a PWM based kind of pulse width modulation based controller and the oops well that's a special case of yeah you told me to move forward when the power was off, or you told me to change direction while I was moving, and things like that. Those come back as an oops, so that it's flagged. In other controllers, it's marked as error, but that's where you would map those type of things. You don't really want to take action on them. You want to be aware of them. So the controllers use a generic command and response structure. It's not <clears throat> layout command control. It's not loco net. It's not any other standard. It's uh, custom fit to our application. Now, originally, we used uh, just a simplistic name value pair, comma separated, but it uh, soon became apparent that we needed a, a better system, not just a made up parser. So we moved to JSON. So what is a parser? Well, it is a means of interpreting what command and data is necessary to accomplish an operation, best I can describe it. And how many parsers does it take to, well, <laughs> and that's why I say we, we quickly realized that um, we had one for commands, another one for configuration, a third for speed steps in the configuration, and we'd finally outgrown our simplistic name value pairs. So JSON to the rescue, if you will. Um, why JSON? Well, there's it's already part of JavaScript. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. Since it's already part of JavaScript and we're already using JavaScript <clears throat> on the client side, why not use it on both sides? It's well documented with open source libraries and it allows both the client and the server to share the same data, if you will. I say map. What is standard map? And how does it work? Well, briefly, um, I, uh, I have an aversion to if, else if, else if, else if, else if, ad nauseum. When it gets to the point where I have 13 else ifs, I have to traipse through to figure out who's doing what, it's just so much easier to put it all in one place where, oh look, when I get this, I do this. When I get this, I do this. So I don't have to worry about, okay, where does that get handled? If you've done any kind of uh, C++ uh, programming with the standard namespace and the standard library, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, if not, well, this is all based on a standard pair. So a standard map has a standard pair of key and value or name and value. So in this case, it's a string for the command name and a function that you want to map to that keyword as neatly as I can put that. 
Uh, so why do we use it? Well, Microsoft always struck me as funny with the way that they used a linear search to where if I had a, a container, so a map or a vector or a queue or you name it, is a container of these values, if you will. And if you had 10,000 items in that container, Microsoft would start at the first one and go through every one of them to the last one of 10,000 looking for what you had specified. If the one that you wanted to select was the last one, it would have to, the last of 10,000, it would have to go through the first 9,999 to get there. I wanted to avoid that. With, uh, with a map as a container, the search function is logarithmic. If it took 10,000 tries to do it in a linear fashion, then a map does it in a log fashion. So if 10,000 is 10 to the fourth power, and you don't need to know math, just know that log of 10,000 or 10 to the fourth is four. So it's that exponent. So at most it would take four comparisons to get to the one that I needed speed and speed min and speed max might take a few because they're all similar and it has to know whether it's speed or speed min or speed max so it has to do a little bit more work and we're talking about why we use a map because the map focuses everything in one location for definition it makes it that much easier to add or modify the command starter if you wanted to add another one say um, fiddle and you could call set fiddle when you got the fiddle command word. It's just that easy to tack it on here at the end. That's kind of an explanation of what we do on the controller side. So on the client side or the web browser side, it's um, also a set of files that are uploaded to the controller but served up one connected uh, via a web browser. Here's the list of files that get uploaded to the uh, Flash file system. So in our case, we have the index HTML file, which is going to be the landing page, if you will, when you talk to the controller. And from there, it includes a cascaded style sheet, and a number of JavaScript files, the, the first of which is the WebSocket, which is the one that we're looking at here. In WebSocket, we focus our attention in one spot or in one place to define all the handling capability. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, the client-side browser interface, also known as a web page, is the user's window into using this controller. And the uh, client and the server both have to agree on the command structure. The structure allows us to handle simplistic actions like pushing a button, getting an action in response. Uh, for example, the power button, the reset button, the direction button things like that. And there's also, uh, it, it allows interactive actions. As a description, uh, the direction, power, and speed slider uh, versus the encoder, um, they're interactive in that if the speed slider or the encoder has selected motion, then the power and the direction buttons need to be locked out, so to speak. Uh, you don't want to be hauling along at 80-85% of maximum throttle and then suddenly reverse direction and derail the train. The other interactive action, if you will, would be uh, you select a new speed with the speed slider on the web interface and uh, someone turns the encoder knob while you're watching the interface on your phone, let's say and we want to keep that all in sync. That implies multiple connections to the same controller. Well, that's inherent with uh, 
Now, it's the nature of a web server, multiple clients. Resources are limited, so uh, we're lucky, I guess, would be one way to put it, that uh, if I remember right, the default maximum number of connections for the WebSocket client is four or five. I'm pretty sure it's five. That means that we have to keep all these interfaces in sync. So rather than just respond to the client that commanded that action, or uh, in the case of the encoder on the front panel, uh, there the client is right there. There is no web client. We, we do a broadcast so that all clients interested uh, get a response as if they had sent the, the command. And they can update their user interface accordingly. Uh, the implication is the client side processing is split into two parts. Uh, one is sending the command in response to clicking a button or moving a slider, whatever that may be. And uh, the other uh, would be updating the user interface based on the response back from the controller. Uh, for instance, if I were to switch the direction, but the controller didn't get the message or somehow misunderstood, then if the response doesn't come back from the controller, the user interface stays at, say I, I change direction from forward to reverse. Well, the response doesn't come back, we stay in the forward position. So you can click on the button as much as you like, but you're not getting a change in direction because the controller isn't getting the command or responding properly or whatever the reason. So splitting the two allows any client to act on the response as if it sent the command. Another consideration is what happens if you refresh the web page. You don't want to all of a sudden go back to, okay, I was moving along at 85% of uh, full throttle and now all of a sudden it says zero. Um, it allows uh, the client to refresh and remember all the settings without having to use cookies or other mechanisms. If we have more than a few people trying to control one locomotive without it breaking out into a fight, uh, we'd, we'd be lucky. By splitting the, the interface and using this uh, client and server side, um, we can use whatever custom interface we want, whatever front end we want over the generic server back end. And a good example of that's the passenger car lighting. I have the same code running behind every passenger car, but the, uh, the client side has uh, different pictures of the different uh, passenger cars. Uh, so each one has a picture of itself, if you, if you will. And the configuration tells the server, what the car number is, things like that, you know, what color it is, whether it's a combination car, so on and so forth. Uh, the idea there is if you don't like the front end that we provide, then write your own page and put it, upload it to the controller, and that's what you'll see. Um, so it's entirely flexible. Uh, to conclude, I've hopefully not gotten too long-winded here, but in conclusion, uh, we use the standard Arduino approach and uh, hardware-specific startup handling is encapsulated into the setup and loop handling functions. The goal is to keep the sketch space nice and tidy, if you will, and minimize the pollution from device and interface handling code. And uh, the trade-off is now we have many more files than one to look at, but if we can push most of that into a set of library routines, then all we care about is calling that function. And that, that's, again, the standard Arduino approach is you don't have to do everything. You have libraries that do that. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. So that's the approach that we've taken is to come up with our own libraries that allow our controllers to be generic and configurable. Hopefully this answers some of the questions uh, this uh, 
clears up the mystery of what we mean by controller and this is the generic version of it. I know that I've already captured enough material to put together three or four more very specific um, installments on just programming the different features of these different controllers. So if you'd like to see more of that, please go ahead and uh, you know leave a comment say so. If this is way too much detail, let us know that too. We will custom tailor the material to what you want. And we'll leave it up to you which videos you watch and which ones you don't. So it would be nice to know. It would be nice to have some feedback. So if you don't mind, go ahead and uh, subscribe. And uh, if you like this video, like it. And if not, then dislike it. And we'll know what direction to go. With that, I'm going to wrap up this video on the, the controller software. And we will see you next time. Thanks for watching.